Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome uh, all the members of the Ohio Wesleyan community, the members of the Delaware community, and those individuals that are watching us via web stream. Welcome to another Walter Center uh, lecture. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, today uh, an alum that will be uh, making a presentation. And I would like to invite uh, Dr. Julide Yassar to make the introduction. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you for all uh, coming. It's a real pleasure to um, introduce Kyle Brought to you today. Uh, we welcome Kyle back to campus after 11 years. Um, he graduated in 2003 with a BA in Applied Statistics, Computer Science, and a minor in Economics. Um, he has been working at Grunge Insurance for the last 11 years. Uh, currently, he is the BI and Analytics Manager, uh, leading a um, team of consultants responsible for enterprise portfolio for all data acquisition and delivery. Uh, he's also founder and bivocational pastor of the Liberty Church at Powell. Um, today, he graciously agreed to um, come back to campus and give us a presentation titled The New Information <coughs> Worker Driving Business Results with Data and Analytics. Without further ado, please welcome Kyle Roth. Thank you, Professor Yazar. Thank you, everyone, for having me, students, educators, local community uh, members, and whoever have traveled across land and sea to come see me. I don't think there's anyone in here that's traveled that far, not that famous. But I am an alum, and it's, it's a pleasure to be back here. I haven't been back to OWU a whole lot in the last 11 years. Life gets pretty busy when you step out, and they give you your diploma, and then life just gets away from you. So it's great to be back. Great to um, be with you. A couple other things just to give you some background on me. I live in the Powell area, just south of here. Uh, I was a, a native of Ohio. I grew up in northwest Ohio. Ohio Wesleyan is what brought me down to central Ohio, and I've stayed here ever since. Columbus is a great city, a lot of great companies, a lot of great people, and decided to stay. And I, I live in Powell with my wife, three kids. They're eight, five, and three. My daughter uh, is eight. I got two boys that are five and three, and life is, is busy and lots and lots of fun. So I ran into Dr. Uzar at the mall. He <laughs> said, I think I know you. What's, you know, how, how are you doing? And we got talking, and she invited me to come speak with some of her students, and, and then it turned into this. So that's how I got here. Um, the new information worker is what I've titled the lecture for today. I'm not an expert, but I am a practitioner, and I've been knee deep, neck deep, and drowning at times in dealing with data and analytics and information over the last 12 years. I originally started my career in the actuarial science field and wanted to apply my math major there. And I tried that at Grange Insurance. I found out it wasn't for me. And seven years later, I got an opportunity to switch more into the data analytics business intelligence space, which is a really hot, hot industry that's growing. It's a, it's a buzzword at a lot of companies. And that's just because data is becoming the new oil of industry. It is fueling business decisions. And it is, it's sort of this game that's going on that whoever can acquire the best data and leverage it in the best ways, they're the guys that are going to win. And that's a whole new skill set. And now there's this talent gap. And there's this entire pipeline of, well, who's going to do that kind of work? And who's going to lead the companies? And so kind of this title comes from that, that notion that the, the ground has shifted a little bit underneath companies and even in the leadership space. So if you want to be a business leader someday and you think, well, I've got good strategic skills, I've got good communication, leadership abilities, and things like that, there's this other set of skills that you're going to need, which is, are you data savvy? Can you interact with data? And, you, and, and are you good to some degree with math because you can't really be data savvy without being math savvy to some degree they go hand in hand. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. And my goals are three, just three goals. I want to inspire you. I want to equip you to uh, better chance of success in your careers. And I want to educate you about uh, some technology and some opportunities that are out there in the marketplace. So as I try to inspire you, equip you, and educate you. 
we're going to go through these four main items. We're going to talk about industry trends and opportunities. We're going to look at a couple of the emerging skill sets that I see from where I've sat in an insurance company over the last 12 years. I'm then going to give you a quick technology sneak peek into a software platform called ClickView. And then we're going to close talking about next steps. And we're going to do that all in 30 minutes. I just started the clock. I'm already five minutes behind. So Here's a quote by Arthur Nielsen. He was the founder of the Nielsen Ratings Company. Started that in 1932 because 1932 had a, a, a you can sense the need for marketing companies to better understand the impact of their efforts in the broadcast networks. He said, the price of light is less than the cost of darkness. Now, the people that I've worked with at Grange for the last 12 years say the exact same thing. They don't use those words, but they say things like, if you don't roll out this BI application that shows us how our product launch is going, we're flying in the dark. They view data analytical solutions that give them real-time insight into how the business is performing as their instrument panel, the same way uh, an airline pilot looks at all the gauges as he's flying a plane. It, it's their feedback mechanism to let them know, uh, are they competing well in the marketplace? Are we selling enough? Are we, um, are we growing? Are we shrinking? What are our profit margins? And even internal operations, are we optimizing our internal operations? Here's some interesting observations within the industry. The, an outside firm, IDC, did some research with EMC, which is a software vendor, and they, they, they've done this study for seven years, and their latest one projects that there's going to be a 50-fold increase in the amount of data from 2010 to 2020. And if you were to plot the outcomes of their findings, it looks like a standard exponential curve with the growth of data, and they call that the digital universe. It's sort of the sum of everything digital out there. It's all your Facebook photo, photos, it's all your tweets, it's all the emails, it's all the databases, it's all the web logs, and just on and on and on. It's everything that the NSA has and everyone else has, and they're collecting it and storing it, and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. That's going to grow 50-fold from 2010 to 2020. And what that means is this interesting you know, fact. Don't hold me to the ratios, but it, it goes something like this. Every two years, 80% of the data in the world is brand new. And that's what happens when things grow exponentially, which means for companies, if you're trying to leverage data as a critical asset, what you did five years ago doesn't matter. Because 80% of the stuff that needs to be leveraged has freshly emerged within the last two years. Now, if you look at the software side, according to Gartner, um, the BI software market topped 13 billion in 2000. 12, it's grown double-digit growth for several years, and then it slowed down about 8% in 2013. And some of that's due to confusion out there in the marketplace over these emerging terms. And, and there's, especially when anything gets really hyped and buzzwords out there like BI and analytics and data mining and machine learning, everyone's like, well, what is all of that? I don't know if I want to spend any money just yet. And so the market kind of comes down until there's more clarity around what's going on. On the... On the private sector, there's sort of this analytics arms race. I'll give you kind of a picture of what that looks like here. So every company is going through this maturity cycle with data and analytics. And a lot of them, everyone starts in the bottom left-hand corner. And you've got analytical skills running on the, the y-axis, top to bottom. And you've got business impact running horizontally across the x-axis. And they start in the bottom left doing descriptive analytics, which really answers the question of what happened. And then they get more sophisticated, and they want to move into diagnostic analytics. Why did it happen? And then they want to move on to comparative analytics. Who made it happen? What's the root cause of things? And then they, once they get proficient at that, they want to move into predictive analytics. What's going to happen next? Can you tell me what will happen next month, next year, over the next 10 years? <clears throat> and finally, those who move on beyond that go into prescriptive analytics, trying to answer the question of, how can we make it happen? And so now analytics has come full circle from being something that happens after strategies and projects are put in place and implemented to something that's happening on the front end before a project ever takes off. Trying to tell a company what should your strategy be based on what we can see emerging and forecasting in the marketplace. Now, it's not always linear like this. Companies jump around and they dabble and do, you know, some at the top right before they do the bottom left, but then, you know, it, it's, it's Kind of a, a nice slide to think that it happens stepwise like that. Uh, let's go back here. 
And because of that arms race in the analytical world, there's a, a talent gap out there of skilled business professionals who can help a company do those kinds of things. And so what I've seen is the emergence of undergrad and graduate level programs that never existed before, or they're just being rebranded and re renamed under the business analytics uh, nomenclature or the predictive analytics. Uh, a local example, in 2012, IBM and the Ohio State University launched the IBM Client Center in Dublin, which is a partnership between OSU and IBM. They say that it's going to bring 500 new jobs over the next five to 10 years to Columbus, and they're trying to really invest in building that, type, that pipeline of business professionals, professionals who can come and then move into the marketplace and be adept at dealing with data and analytics. Lastly, cultural trends. So I think this could, may, this could very well be the largest driver of innovation in the data analytics space over the next you know, 10, 20 years. And that, that is the, the cultural expectations of the youth who are entering the marketplace, which goes something like this. It's gotta be simple, it's gotta be fun, it's gotta be searchable, it's gotta be discovery-based, it's gotta be uh, built around storytelling. I gotta understand what's going on. And lastly, it's gotta be everywhere because I got one of these in my pocket and I got, maybe I have two of these and I've got tablets and devices and things everywhere and, and to tell me that I actually have to go to the office and open up or fire up a desktop computer in order to run my business, that's just nonsense. And to tell me that it's gonna take 10 minutes to run a report to find out how my profit margins are performing, that's nonsense. I can go out to, to Google and I can ask this lady on my phone named Siri, tell me you know the, the outcome of the Miami Heat game last night, she tells me right away, it's gotta be simple, it's gotta be fun, fast, search, discovery, storytelling, and it's gotta be everywhere. Every company is at a different place in their maturity of how they are embracing and engaging these new trends. <coughs> Wayne Eckerson is a, a BI, he's a true BI expert. I've, I've met him, I've had lunch with him several times. He's helped us at Grange Insurance on occasion, and he used to, I'm not sure if he still works for them or not, but there's the, the Data Warehousing Institute. At one time, he crafted this BI maturity model while he was working with them, and it just shows how companies, organizations move from being uh, very immature on the left to mature on the right in their data and analytics sophistication. <coughs> on the left-hand side, if you just look, really all I want you to see at the top is those words in blue. On the very left, it's just a cost center. This capability for a company, it's just, you know, it, all it does is, you know, make me write a check in order to do it. But I gotta do it. And then it moves into informing executives. And then <coughs> as companies mature, the data and analytics becomes an empowering aspect of every knowledge worker in the building. It's not just a few people now. It's it's the status quo. This is how everybody does their job. They, they do data and analytics, or they consume it. They may not build it, but they just they consume it to make decisions. And then moves into some monitoring, and then there's this, in Word there, there's this chasm. There's kind of these two chasms that, that show, hey, it's really hard to move beyond this. And that last one, uh, when you get to the far right, you're starting to not only just drive the business and the company you work for, but you may actually start to drive the entire market that you're in. And we, I've seen examples of that with very innovative insurance uh, companies out there. The things that they're doing in the data analytics space, uh, they basically are the leader, and then every other player, if you wanna compete, you have to start doing what they're doing because they are cutting edge with data and analytics. So, one question to think about is when you do get a job, ask your employer, where would they rate themselves from a data analytics maturity model? Are they young and immature on the left? Or are they a wise sage on the right? Because they'll tell you a lot about how they treat data, the types of solutions that they'll give you, and the opportunities ahead. Because the talent gap is there, and because data is the new oil of industry, it, it causes a need for, like I said, a new skill set to emerge not just for you as you start to enter the workforce, but how do you create this new skill set within the existing employees of a company, which is much harder. Uh, it's a great quote there 
Dr. Meinstein himself. And it really speaks to the fact that at, at times there's, you're drowning in data and there's way too much of it and you shouldn't be looking at it. And other times, the really good stuff that you should be thinking at, about, you just can't quite capture it and measure it. And that set of data that you really need to be looking at but you can't quite capture, if you couldn't do it yesterday, you'll be able to do it tomorrow. And it changes. And you think about just quantum physics and the, the stuff that they measure today with particle colliders and the energy and they're measuring things of the unseen world that no one ever imagined they'd be able to measure and think about. You can do it today, couldn't do it tomorrow. There's things we'll do in the future that we can't do today. So it's a, it's a changing world. Uh, Newsweek kind of grabbed onto this, this dilemma that the information <coughs> worker finds themselves in. And this was from 2011. It says, look, all this data is causing the decision makers to just you know, run into brain freeze. I'm overloaded with information. And there are too few thought leaders out there in companies who are uncovering the right information and there's too much time out there being spent uh, as well in getting the data and not enough time sleeping. Now, when I was in college, I liked to hear that. Too much time going to class and not enough time sleeping. I love sleep. What the article is saying is that people in companies are spending too much time trying to wrestle with just getting the information, they're not allowing their subconscious minds to actually process and think about the implications and the ramifications of it. And researchers have actually studied to show that when you go to sleep at night, your brain actually processes everything that you encountered and thought about during the day. It actually tries to make sense of all the data that you ran into. So if you ever have brain freeze, just go to bed, it'll help. That's what they're saying. Well, with these new skill sets to help overcome brain freeze and to close this, this uh, talent gap on the data side, I really believe you gotta be data savvy, which means you sort of have to be math savvy. Now, everybody doesn't like math, and I get that, but I do. I love math, and part of what would make today successful is if I can get you to love math just a little bit more than you loved it when you came in this morning, or this afternoon. So. Oftentimes, the people I deal with in the business kind of have this mentality that I don't care if the data doesn't mean anything, I just need a number and I need it now. Because so and so asked me for a number or there's a decision that's gonna be made and it's gotta be quick and easy. So they like to say, well, find X, well, here it is. There you go. For the love of math, let's talk a little bit about calculus because I know calculus is a polarizing topic. Some of you love it, some of you hate it. And I would hope that maybe you can love it a little bit more, like I said, before we're done. So daunting task before me, but tune in for just a second. Calculus and derivatives, so what? Well, so what? I tell you what, calculus and derivatives is how we understand basic business questions like, are we growing? Just a basic question for every company, whether you are running Twitter or running a manufacturing plant and you're selling, selling automobiles, are we growing as a company? And calculus helps us understand both trajectory and acceleration and there's a concept in calculus called your first derivative and it tells you the slope of a line. And the slope tells us are we heading up or are we heading down? And that's what business leaders always go to bed at night thinking about. Are we going up, going down? They don't know it, but they're thinking about slopes and first derivatives and trajectories and acceleration concepts. Now, what most people don't think about is second derivatives. Okay, second derivatives are awesome because they tell us this wonderful thing called inflection points. And this is where you get into the concept of acceleration. Think about it uh, like when you're driving your car and you've had your cruise on, and as soon as you hit your brakes, suddenly you're decelerating. You're going down. But you're coasting, so you're just kind of going down slowly. At some point, you really hit the brakes, and now you're going slower, really fast, much, much, much slower, and stopping is imminent. Executives always worry about when will the company stop, and is that imminent, and are we slowing at a pace that foretells our impending doom. 
Second derivatives help people understand acceleration. And what's really interesting is that calculus can be used to inform business leaders' emotions. Things like optimism, excitement, thrill, euphoria, and then it crashes into anxiety, denial. No, we are not slowing as a company. We're not being bought out. We're not being driven out by our competition. And then, okay, we are, but now I'm desperate, and now we're going to panic, and now we're going to make a lot of really crazy decisions to, you know, right the ship back over. Uh, maybe we'll capitulate on our core principles, and we'll do things that we said we'd never do, and then we become despondent because all is lost. And then the market rebounds and now I'm optimistic and hopeful and cheerful about the future. All those emotions go through business leaders' um, hearts and souls and minds and keep them up at night. Calculus. Calculus helps business leaders harness the right emotions because it tells them the truth about whether they're growing or not growing, whether they're growing or shrinking. So I want to show you these two slides because it's the same set of data and it tells you two very different pictures of what's going on. So this is a random set of data that I came up with, and it's simulated over a four-year period, and it's all it's showing is, we'll just say, number of accounts. So if you were running Twitter, and you were CEO of Twitter, you're thinking about how many Twitter accounts do I have? Am I growing? Am I shrinking? If I grow, then that means more money. If I shrink, then people lose interest. We lose money. We all go home. It's over. This top left-hand chart, this is the number of Twitter accounts. Just pretend that that's what it is. And the data points are week by week. Any business model that has an in-out flow to it, this is applicable to it. It could be the number of donors to the Ohio Wesleyan Endowment Fund. Every year, some new ones join in, and some decide they'll no longer participate. So any business model that's got an in-out flow, it could be customers acquired, lost. It could be the number of enrollees in government health care. That's the top left-hand chart. And what happens is when you just look at number of customers, you see those two arrows, the, the red arrows pointing down. They're showing where these emotions of excitement, thrill, euphoria, fear, desperation kick in. And it's usually when they start heading downward. So that top left-hand arrow is when things started slowing down and shrinking, actually just shrinking. And the bottom right-hand arrow is when things stabilized. People start getting afraid and desperate when they hit that first peak with the first arrow. And then they tell themselves, we can have relief and hope when we hit that second arrow. Math savvy people, data savvy people, people who understand acceleration, trajectory, growth, and are math savvy, they build charts like this bottom right one, which tells a different story. This is your slope. This is your first derivative. And where those stars are, those indicate inflection points. And inflection points is when the business changes from shrinking at an increasing rate to shrinking at a decreasing rate. Increasing at an increasing rate to increasing at a decreasing rate. And you notice that the arrow, or the star, comes about a year, in this, in this example, comes about a year before the break point. So in this bottom left-hand chart, everything above the line here, company's growing. Company's shrinking here. Everyone's excited. Everyone's scared. Inflection point is here, and that's when you should be afraid. Because you were growing at an increasing rate, and now you're growing at a decreasing rate, which means shrinking as a company is inevitable unless you do something. And now you're shrinking. Everyone's scared and afraid. Here's your next inflection point. It's your second derivative. This is where optimism, hope, resiliency enters back into the business because you're going from shrinking at a decrease, increasing rate to shrinking at an increasing rate. And you always have to shrink at an increasing rate before you start growing. And you need to be able to tell your business when that occurs because then they start making different decisions. So that's math calculus derivatives and all kinds of emotional things that people go through when they leave the business. <coughs> got to be data savvy, got to be math savvy. Here's another skill set that I think is very critical for business leaders. Storytelling ability. You want to be good in the data analytics space, you're going to have to learn to 
tell good stories, and you're going to have to use data to tell those stories. Stories are powerful because they connect the past, the present, and the future all in a single coherent way that everybody can understand. And stories are also powerful because they place people in the midst of that information. When you just show a chart, it's data. It's information. You don't see yourself in the midst of the information. But as soon as you start giving contextual storytelling on top of that and saying, this is what happened. This is when we launched. Oh, yeah, I remember those days. Everyone was excited. This is when the stock market crashed. Oh, yeah, I didn't know what we were going to do. This is when we launched our new product. This is when we opened up into an entire new uh, you know, Western region of the company. What, whatever it is, it's emotionally moving. It's critically illuminating. And storytelling, most of all, is very powerful for shifting people's perspectives. It shifts people's perspectives in the ways that just mere data cannot. It's a great quote here. It says he uses statistics as a drunken man uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. I've met so many people who want to use data and analytics just to prove they're right get somebody to um, approve their project, but they've very closed off to maybe discovering something that they haven't uh, discovered on their own before. Hans Rosling is a Swedish professor of global health at the Karolinska Institute. This guy does data storytelling better than anybody I've ever seen. And so one of the best ways for me to inspire you is to let somebody else inspire you because, you know, I can only do so much and there's a lot of great people out there that can do more. So let me give you, we're going to watch a, a three-minute clip here of Hans Rosling doing data storytelling. It's thinking. Let's try this again. So this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did the software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. The, uh, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? <laughs> and they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we stop the world. And this is all UN statistic that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China, they're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries 
countries, they are moving towards smaller families. Your yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they, no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Let me make a comparison directly between United States of America and Vietnam, 1964. America had small families and long life. Vietnam had large families and short lives. And this is what happens. The data during the war indicate that even with all the death, there was an improvement of life expectancy. By the end of the year, the family planning started in Vietnam and they went for smaller families. And the United States up there is getting for longer life, keeping family size. And in the 80s now, they give up communist planning and they go for market economy and it moves faster even than social life. And today we have in Vietnam the same life expectancy and the same family size here in Vietnam, 19, 2003, as in United States, 1974, by the end of the war. I think we all, if we don't look... That is data storytelling. <clears throat> People will listen to you if you can connect what's happening to them as individuals and teams and companies with data. They will listen to you and you will be a wonderful leader and employee for them. You can check out more of his videos if you just search for Hans Rosling and look at, I believe he has nine different, six, six to nine different talks on TED.com. Okay, so we talked about some of the skill sets, being data savvy, storytelling. We talked about some of the broader industry trends. Okay, data's everywhere, it's growing out, everyone's drowning in it. Uh, what do we do about it? Everyone's spending money on it. Let's talk a little bit about technology. If your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. You know what the corporate equivalent of this is? Microsoft Excel. <laughs> we all love it. It's not even corporate, it's probably just like a world, I mean, it's Microsoft, it's a global, you know, hammer. You know, I can do Excel, I can solve every problem in the world with Excel. Excel is wonderful and you can solve a lot of things with it, but there's a lot of other technology that is being built out there that uh, does other things um, in different ways and more suited for the occasion. As, I don't know if it was, it, yeah, it wasn't mentioned in my introduction, but I've been at Grange for about 12 years, and one of the technology solutions that we've used in the last three years to do BI and data and analytics is a technology platform called ClickView. Comes from the parent company, Click Tech. They're a Swedish based company. They've been around for about 20 years doing data visualization, data discovery, mainly in its inception over in Europe. And then the last 10 years, they've had a lot of double digit growth in the States. We brought ClickView into Grange because we wanted to do data and analytics faster, better, do it more intuitive. And we wanted to do it in a way that was culture changing. There are a lot of teams in every company that are scared of data and analytics, and, and rightfully so, because it's just kind of wild and crazy at times. Well, it takes smart people and good technology to kind of take away all those fears and give it to uh, large teams of people, in which you can then drive the adoption and get the embrace of that solution. So we brought ClickView in. This is just a picture of their, their main home site. We call it a business discovery platform because it allows three or four main core pieces of functionality. One of them is social discovery. So again, this new cultural expectation set of people is that we make decisions in teams and together rather than as individuals. 
I'm, if I'm going to be harnessing data to make my decision, I'm going to be doing it with others, I need a way to collaborate and share what I'm finding and what I'm discovering with them in real time and with historical continuity so that we can see as a team how we got to where we're at in making our decisions. The ClickView platform has a strong social collaborative component to it. It also has uh, a rapid app, app development feature. I mean, that just means that you can build things quicker than you can with maybe other technology platforms. And that comes back again. You know, if you're, if you're an information worker and you're reporting to someone or serving a particular area, you're going to hear them say those things like, I don't care, I just need it now. And so the faster you do it, the faster your technology can do it, the more advantageous it is to everyone around. Thirdly, uh, the ClickView platform allowed us to connect massive amounts of disparate data. And <coughs> disparate data simply means that there's data scattered everywhere in all kinds of different systems that were never designed in the first place to ever have to talk to each other. And it's a mess. And every company has a data mess because, it, unless they're brand new, the brand new guys, they get to you know, start fresh and make it all clean and make it all nice and they just have to wait 20 years until they got a mess and everything that they've built doesn't talk to each other. Uh, but if, if you're with a seasoned company who has lots of legacy applications that have been built over the last 50 years, you've got a data mess on your hands and you need a technology platform that can connect those together in a rapid fashion and allow people to collaborate across them. Uh, another thing is it allows, w with that massive data, is speed of thought analysis and that's sort of a way of, of speaking to that, again, a cultural expectation that things have to be fast. I need directions, I type it into Google Maps, it tells me in under a second. If I've got a business question, I want to find out who my top producing sales offices are or what my top selling product is, and within those products, which, uh, which geographic regions are selling or not selling, and what's the 10-year the trend been across those, and how does that relate to census data and the, you know, the demographic information that just came in. Can I do that in under five minutes? If I can't, I'm going to be frustrated as an information worker. We needed um, speed of thought analysis, click, answer, click, answer, ask another question, click, 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 answer, ask another question. Oh, I didn't think of that question, that's not where I started, but now I'm asking that question because I saw something, click, 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 and that's how we surf the web, right? That's how we surf the web. We click, we find, we discover, we ask another question, we click, discover, and go on and on and on. That's the world for company. That's, that's the, the culture environment, technology that we, that we gotta get to. And then lastly, it's gotta be highly intuitive and it's gotta be fun because if it's not fun, nobody likes doing it. Um, I was at Sky Zone yesterday with my family. There was this big letter on the wall from I think it was a, a physiologist, or I, I, I forget who exactly. Basically, it just said, I love your place. I was here for an hour. I had so much fun, I didn't even realize I was working out. And when you're jumping on trampolines, and you're getting muscular endurance buildup and muscular strength, and you're getting uh, you know, neurophysical coordination abilities going, all this stuff, but you're having so much fun, so you didn't think about it. It's not quite like you know, running on a treadmill. If BI data analytics solutions, the things that we build for teams, if we can't build them in a way that's intuitive and fun, it takes some, a lot of the interest and, and then, you don't, then it just sits on the shelf. Nobody likes spending money on things that just sit on the shelf because people don't like using them. All right, so I'm running out of time. I want to save some, uh, a slot for Q&A. So I do want to show you one quick demo of ClickView. And you can do this all on your own. So everything that I'm doing right now, don't feel like, oh, I wish we would have spent more time on this. You can get the link. You can go out and do and discover and just explore on your own. It's all free. I want to show you uh, a ClickView web application that they built for the Winter Global Games just recently in Sochi. A couple, couple of questions here. Which country has won the most medals over time? What are my chances of winning as a Nordic speed skater someday? I know that's what you were thinking about this morning. You woke up and you're thinking about life, big decisions, Nordic speed skater is one of them. Okay, I'm gonna help you answer that one. And geographically speaking, is the ratio of athletes to medals 
a fair system for the Winter Games. So let's take a quick peek. And again, this has got to be quick. It's got to be fun. It's got to be intuitive. It's got to be able to share these things. And I've got to want to come back and do more of this the next day. Otherwise, I'll quit my job and say, I don't like this. Um, so let's get out of here. I'll give you a quick peek. ClickView technology is all web-based, so development teams build it in an internal shop, and then they can roll it out over the web to anybody, anywhere within their organization. First question, who is winning the most medals over time? One second answer, it's Norway. We've got 118 gold, 113 silver, and 101 bronze. The United States is second, Germany is third. So let's just click on Norway, because I woke up this morning thinking, can I be a Nordic skied skate, or speed skating champion? Gosh, that's a tongue twister. Let's click on Norway. Let's come over to the country profile. And it knows that we're interested or it knows that we already picked Norway, so we don't have to pick that again on this page. Let's just highlight speed skating. Quickly, it breaks down the, the number of medals by the type of race within speed skating as soon as I clicked on speed skating, so I can know are they, are they winning in the long distance races, are they winning in the short races. Up here, I'm seeing the performance, the number of medals and athletes over time. If I just turn on the medals, so that's uh, every four years, the number of gold, bronze, and silver, silver medals in speed skating. And then let's come up here to, I believe it's the characteristics. And right away, I can see that the heaviest speed skater is 185 pounds and the lightest was 160. Okay, that might be in my range, so I might qualify from a weight perspective. From a height perspective, it's 5'5 five, five to 6'2. Okay, all right. And then from an age, they're all 18 to 31. And we're talking about people who actually win, okay? Not, not the people who dreamt about it. Well, I'm too old, so my dreams of being a Nordic speed skater are over. Let's look at something else. Let's look at the histograms. A little bit more detail. Again, I don't have to click anything else. I just dive in a little bit deeper to the data. From a weight perspective, I knew that the lightest person was 160 pounds, but really it's only 10% of the people who are winning medals. That's kind of a long shot. It looks like 40% of the people are in the 180 pound weight range, and that seems for whatever reason to be a magic, or not a magic, but it's a, if I were to be a Nordic ski speed skater, I'd want to be about 180 pounds. You notice uh, the females didn't answer that question, which is why the men never asked them about their weight, and it's obvious here in the data as well. They won't tell you um, those answers. From a height perspective, looks like most of the men uh, around five, right around six foot. Women get to be a little bit taller if they want to win. And then you get a distribution of the age. Um, notice how easy that is to find all this information. If you combine that into a fully automated production environment where this app, let's, let's say the data coming in was real time from the games as it's happening, which it was while the games were going on, me as the user has to do this much effort. If I can click a mouse, I can get at the data. And I can now spend time thinking about, am I really gonna be a Nordic speed skater? What do I do about that? Should I lose weight? Should I get taller? Should I get younger? Should I practice more? What do I do in light of this data? And that's what the business community has to get to. Spend more time thinking about implications, inferences, ramifications. Go to bed thinking about what you should do. Spend less time actually getting your hands on the data. And that's where ClickView comes in. Um, last question, and then we'll go to Q&A.
geographically is, let's clear this out. So let's go back to looking at all countries. Geographically, is it fair the ratio of those who send athletes to those who win medals? What you're seeing here is a, a heat map of all the countries in the world who send athletes to the Winter Games, all years, all competitions. And you notice that it's kind of scattered all around. Let's look at the heat map of all the countries who actually win medals. What do you notice? Is it fair? If you were born in the southern hemisphere and don't live in Australia, do you, what do you think your chances are of winning a medal at the Winter Olympics? It's pretty slim. How did I come to that conclusion? Just by a quick glance at the graph. I've seen all winnings across all Winter Olympics. That's click view. Hope that piques your interest. I, I hope that you know what I've I've shown you. What I've shown you today um, has inspired, equipped, and educated you. Here's some next steps. I'm just going to leave this up for afterwards, and I do want to turn this over to Q and A and see if you have any questions. So, what questions do you have about math, technology, the data analytics industry, click view? Other, uh, a comment and a question. Uh, you know, first of all, you have to frame the question correctly. There is no Olympic event called Nordic speed skating. There's Nordic skiing. There are people from Norway, but you know, you're, you're asking a question about an event that doesn't exist. Well, maybe that's my own ignorance. Could you, could you clarify what you mean? There is no Olympic event called Nordic Speed Skating. There is an event called Nordic Skiing. There are Olympic athletes from Norway, but the question you asked is about an event that doesn't exist. How would you rephrase it? <laughs> well, isn't that part of what you need to do? But I don't know what it is you're trying to find out. Are you trying to find out about speed skating or athletes from Norway? I follow you. I was showing you speed skaters who had won whose country of origin was Norway. But there's a difference between somebody who's Norwegian and there is an Olympic event called Nordic speed, or skiing. Okay, so maybe some of my semantics, again, my ignorance of not being proficient in Olympic terminology, so I apologize for any okay. you know, confusion but I've created. Uh, but but yeah. let's go back um, yeah. to that uh, double uh, graph where you had the, the bars and you also had the, sure. um, you know, the, the, the solid line. The, tell me when to... Okay, right there. Let's look at the, um, the second star in the bottom graph. Okay. Notice before we reach that point of optimism, well, just a short time period before that, all of a sudden things really look like they're improving. So if you go to that point just a little bit to the left of the star, I'd say, wow, things are really improving. How do I know that this is going to be a double dipper? You don't. And hindsight's 2020. <laughs> and so when you're in a business, the world, all you get to see is that piece. And so you're sitting with people here theorizing about, is it going to be a double dipper? Have we really hit the cusp and are we really heading back up? Let's wait and see. Now, in other applications, that's where some of the more sophisticated predictive analytic models come into play is because they will start forecasting out the future before it happens and putting confidence intervals around things to say, this, I know we're right here, and it'd be very optimistic for us to think that it's going to go like this, but what if it just goes like this? Or what if it goes up and then it goes further down? Uh, some of the more advanced, you know, these, are, these are PhD level statistical modelers who are doing forecasting 
routines to try and scenario test what the future may look like. And the truth of it is nobody really knows. Mm -hmm. But from a, it, it's also meaningful from a, from a hindsight, what did we learn, what did we do? And we can look at that inflection point and you can tie it to maybe a specific thing, initiative, a project, a product launch, or whatever that the company did and say, hey, yeah, we really did tip the needle when we did X and we see it in the data. It's a lot harder to see that significant event that happened there up here and figure out, because when you look at the star up there, it's just not very visible. It almost looks like a straight line descent. You don't see the inflection point as clearly. But you're totally right. We don't know. Thanks. Any other questions? Technology related? Yes. Um, yeah. So you talked a lot about um, math and calculus and while it's very useful, I'm just curious how computer programming can also come in. Should people also not shy away from computer programming? Definitely do not shy away from computer programming. <clears throat> because I'm, I'm asking you because I think like in the last one year or two years, for the last 10 years, people have been afraid of math classes. Yeah. But suddenly now there's a second now that computer programming and computer science is becoming a lot more popular, yeah. most people are also getting scared of those classes. Yeah. So people are like, oh, you're better off taking calculus than computer programming. You're not going to survive in that. I wouldn't pit the two against each other. I think they're both invaluable for the coming age of what businesses need. Um, if you look at on this next step slide, you'll see that You know, there's a lot of new graduate programs in machine learning. It's a real hot button uh, topic out there. And, and it really sh shifts away from more of the traditional statistical math modeling, which says I can, I can model data with a math formula. Machine learning, and the programmers come alongside and they say, we're not going to model it. We don't need to come up with a formula to approximate reality. We're just going to mine it. We're going to find patterns. We're going to do pattern recognition, and we're going to make associations between events over here and events over there. And the machine is going to be programmed to find those associations. And it's very different than traditional statistical math modeling. So yes, there's lots of opportunities there. And if that's something you're interested in, you should definitely pursue it. Any other questions? Hi. Um, you said that the, the job field is growing in the data sector. Um, what exactly would those jobs entail? Is it more researching and finding the statistics, or is it more like calculating the statistics and finding derivatives? Like, What exactly in that area do, sure. are the jobs growing? There are IT jobs, which would, the IT shops would typically focus on acquiring the data. DBAs, database programmers. There's a lot of data warehousing teams where their sole charge is to go and acquire data and then process it, restructure it, and save it historically for whomever and whatever. That's their job, acquire data. And then um, there are BI reporting teams. They could either be on the IT side of a company or they could be on the business side that's actually then tapping into that data and kind of doing the front end presentation like some of the demos that I showed you of how do I present this to the user in a way that's automated so that they can interact with it and make sense of it. And so there's a lot of consultation going on of, uh, you know, uh, I, the last four years I've sat in a, in a centralized shared service model where we have 15 different departmental units who come to us and say, this is my business problem. Can you ha leverage data in any way to help me answer this question? And so we consult with them and build stuff like that. You could also, I, I expect there's going to be a lot of growth on, on the more technical, statistical, you know, computer science side as well. So a research group would be a user of data, but they would be doing very different things with the data than just, say, building reports or dashboards or, you know, information delivery. So if you wanted to go the more technical, mathematical CS route, you'd probably land yourself in a research group. If you wanted to go the more 
information management IT route, you might end up in a business intelligence shop somewhere doing DBA or data warehousing type of things. Or there's a whole nother, again, IT and the technical groups can't do this by themselves. So there's the entire business side as well. You just want to be a business leader. Well, IT shops normally throw their hands up in there and say, well, we can build anything, but we only want to build what you want. What do you want? And the business says, well, I don't know. I don't know how to think like that. And so nothing gets done. So if you're more of a business leader and, and you like that side, you, know, you, could, you could be the one informing what get, gets built from a data. You know, so you could sit down and you could say, well, we're going we're gonna to enter into this new state with this new company and this new product, and here's how we evaluate success and come up with you know, tangible data metrics that would tell you whether or not it's going well and then tell them to go build it. They love people who can do that for them. Any other questions? Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, coming. I'll stick around for a few minutes, and you know we can chat offline about anything. Thank you. <laughs>